What's up, my Canadian cousins? Today is the Friday before Halloween, so I thought I would do a Halloween-themed video. But I also want to stick to my um, curiosity journey of learning about Canadian history. So I'm combining my love for Halloween and my passion for history into today's reaction video. Now, I actually do know a lot about um, which scares, which trials, and witch hunting. Um, I became fascinated with it when I visited Salem, Massachusetts years ago. And of course, I think in North America, we all know about the infamous Salem witch uh, trials. But, you know, witch hunting and the witch scares have been around for a long, long time, but they became particularly bad in the 1500s and the 1600s um, because of a book that was written by a German monk uh, called the Malleus Maleficorum. And it was basically a manual on witch hunting uh, that um, people who were involved in witchcraft were in league with the devil, which wasn't always a connection. And uh, so, you know, this, this book was really insidious and sparked a terrible uh, phase in European history that resulted in, in thousands and thousands and thousands of deaths. It's really hard to know how many. And of course, that was exported over here to the New World and and in New England in particular. Um, in England, it had become bad just shortly before that under King James, who was convinced that uh, there was a cabal of witches from Scotland uh, in league with people from the continent to kill him. And so things just got a lot worse. But there was also witch hunting in France. And so I thought to myself, well, were, was there an equivalent to the Salem uh, witch trials in New France? Um, and in the 1600s, and I found one video, actually searched a lot and didn't come up with much except for this one video on it. And it seems like maybe from the title, the answer is yes. It's uh, from Canadian History with Steve Wilson. I urge you to check him out. I think his channel looks like it could use some help. Um, but let's see what he has to say about this topic and see if you guys know anything that you can supplement uh, what we learn here today, and let's get to it. Hey guys, and don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't already, welcome back if you're a subscriber, and hit the notification bell. Have a very happy and safe Halloween. History after dark. Canadian history after dark. I know you polite Canadians turn into monsters after dark, right? We have to be careful. Just kidding, just kidding. Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 summits here. I'm gonna be doing a Vimy Ridge video uh, very soon within the next week or so. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well known, but not necessarily well known nationwide. And while much of the history of Canada is solidly rooted in fact, there are a number of stories which leave more questions than answers. There is a part of the history of Canada, even the land before Canada as a country existed, where there are mysteries, legends, myths, and stories that shiver the soul. And these stories are just as important as the ones we all know about. And we will be telling some of those stories today. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. Witchcraft, trials, and executions. Bringing up the subject in Canada harkens an image from the United States, the Salem Witch Trials. Those cases were just a portion of the more than 300 cases that, what you that think were of tried when you hear in witch, witch during trials? the 17th century. These yeah. trials came about from a number of things. The fear of witches and the unknown, anti-intellectualism, a desire to get rid of those who were considered undesirable in the community, revenge, and more. The 
Part of the beginning of the Salem uh, witch trials was a land dispute. ...of witchcraft neighbors. trials and executions in New England was part of a phenomenon seen throughout much of the Western world. After all, there were witchcraft trials and executions in Britain, France, and many other countries. Given that information, Germany it could especially. easily be thought that there were similar things that happened in Canada. But in our collective memory, not much is there. Which leads to the hmm. question, were there similar trials with similar outcomes in Canada? Many are surprised to find out the answer is yes. Well, kind of. It was nowhere near the same as you saw elsewhere. Very much a different situation. We hmm. have to remember that in Canada during the 17th century, French law was the law. This was still New France with first and second generation citizens who were governed by people who came over to the colonies from France. Okay. Back in France, how witchcraft charges were persecuted were very, very different than in Britain and by extension New England. First was the evidence that would be entered into one of those trials. Under French law, if something was deemed impossible in the natural world, it couldn't be considered as credible evidence. This means Ah, uh, I see where this is going already. Um, if you've studied the Salem witch trials in any detail, you'll see that they um, admitted what they called spectral evidence. So, you know, a lot of the people who claimed to have been afflicted were teenagers and they claimed to have seen the specter of so-and-so coming to them at night and... Uh, <laughs> This court, which was, you know, legal but also religious, um, the Puritans uh, took that evidence and found it convincing. And that's just uh, evidence such as finding a wild. witch's mark on a person, or that you had seen someone yeah. flying on a broom, or that they had cursed you in a dream. That wouldn't be admissible. Or that they had a familiar, you know, if 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 a uh, alleged witch had a pet bird or you know kept toads or something like that they would they would say that that's the witch is familiar like an embodiment of the devil or demon contrast this with how things were handled in new england a midwife was found guilty of witchcraft and put to death on the evidence that and i'm paraphrasing a touch here she had told a patient that if they didn't follow her, her advice they wouldn't heal properly and then they didn't heal properly and she was accused of witchcraft <laughs> Or let's look at perhaps it's not funny. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm America. laughing because it's ridiculous. There, much of the evidence was speculative. These are real evidence. people who basically were the testimony of, this. of the accusers that they saw the apparition of the person being accused, even in their dreams. The reasoning behind this was that it was Spectral the devil evidence. doing this, and the devil couldn't use the shape of a person without their permission. So therefore, the accused was complicit with the devil. So I, now I know everybody's wondering, you know, we're talking about the United States, but this is a podcast about Canadian history. So what about trials that would have been happening in what is now Canada during the same time frame in New France? Well, what happened? Well, no, it's good he did that so that, you know, you can compare. Well, take a look at work by Robert Lionel Seguin. He worked over the years and determined that there are around 22 instances of supernatural involvement in cases that went before the courts. The majority of these, though, were a passing reference to other charges. In fact, most of them came nowhere near what would be considered a witchcraft trial like there was in New England. In his article, Witchcraft in New France in the 17th Century, written back in the winter of 1977, Jonathan L. Pearl detailed one of the cases that became before a seigneurial court in Montreal in 1658. Quote, a disappointed suitor named Besnard cast a spell on his former sweetheart by tying of ritual knots in a string. This spell was a traditional way of causing impotence in men. It was widely practiced in France and greatly feared. The whole area of human sexuality and fertility was a special target for diabolical spells. Since failure to carry out the sexual act or to conceive was perceived as very abnormal and quite mysterious, it was quickly ascribed to supernatural interference. In this case, the newlyweds blame someone else. Frightened at hearing of the spell, found it impossible to consummate their marriage and accused Besnard of causing perpetual impotence caused by Melephis. This court 
dissolved the marriage and found Besnard guilty. He was fined 700 pounds and banished from Montreal. His accusers quickly married other partners. The ex-husband eventually fathered 14 children and the ex-wife bore 11, which of course confirmed in their minds that their earlier problems had been caused by the devil and his earthly agent Besnard. Unquote. Now there hmm. are some records of the testimony from this trial, which shows in a way the attitude towards witchcraft in New France. At one point, Besnard was asked if he told the wife he would remove the spell if she slept with him while her husband was away. Besnard stated in court, quote, Yes, I did say that, but not because I did the magic. It was only because I wanted to enjoy her, unquote. <laughs> this is perhaps one of the biggest differences in terms of the sentence uh, between New France and New England. When a person was sentenced to death under French law, no matter the charge, they could appeal their sentence. Most people who were found guilty of witchcraft or blasphemy would be sentenced to banishment instead of death. This was to avoid the cost of an appeal, which the magistrates had to cover in a death sentence, not the accused. This doesn't mean that there weren't executions for cases involving witchcraft. Magistrates would have to cover the cost themselves or, or out of the public purse. Hmm, interesting. Craft in New France. Let's look at the case of a miller accused of causing the demonic possession of 16-year-old Barb Halle. It started with a report of voices in the air and a fiery canoe in the sky. And this report came from Marie de la Can Incarnation, an Ursuline nun. And these events started shortly after the arrival of new colonists in 1660. Among the new arrivals were Halle and a man named Daniel Viol. We will note that Viol was a Protestant who had converted to Catholicism during the voyage to New France, and this is very important to the rest of the case. Okay. On this voyage, Viol tried his best to hook up with the teenager, and she refused him the whole way. Once they got to New France, Viol went to Beauport near Quebec. Halle was he tried to hook up with the teenager. That's a very, very uh, old-fashioned historical term. to work term as a servant with. in a home. By December, that home became the scene of a number of strange events. Jesuit missionary Let's Paul, back up a second. on this voyage, Buell tried his Sorry, best guys. to hook up with the teenager, and she refused him the whole way. Once they got to New France, Buell went to Beauport near Quebec. Halle went on to work as a servant in a home. By December, that home became the scene of a number of strange events. Jesuit missionary hmm. Paul Raguignon wrote, quote, the girl's home was so infested that stones were flying from all sides, thrown by invisible hands, hurting no one, though they flew through 20 persons or so, with a noise and a force as great as if they had been launched by a mighty arm." Unquote. Shortly afterwards, the girl started to have visions of demons, happens. and these demons started to possess her, speaking through her. The Bishop of New France, Francois de Laval, was called in. He ordered the local priest to perform an exorcism, which didn't work. Then Laval himself tried to perform an exorcism. Still no success. Halle was taken to the only hospital in New France, l'Hôtel Dieu de Québec. There, she would be seen by Mother Catherine de Saint-Augustine. She was considered the holiest woman in New France and was considered to be somewhat of an expert in dealing with demons. She would do what she could to alleviate the suffering of the poor teenager. While all of this was happening, more was learned about Daniel Viol. In a rare instance of spectral evidence being cited in a case in New France, after Halle stated of the visions that she was having, one of them included Viol, he was arrested. Witchcraft, though, was not the only reason why Viol had been arrested. Remember how we mentioned he had converted to Catholicism on the voyage? Turns mm -hmm. out this was just so he would have been able to cross over and settle in New France. Rules had been put in place decades earlier to prevent Huguenots who were Protestants from emigrating to New France. After arriving in New France, Viol had relapsed back to... What rules were put into place? Was it illegal to travel to New France unless you were Catholic, or were there certain Protestant denominations uh, that were not permitted, like Huguenots? Protestantism, a crime which was punishable by death. New France... Well, maybe he just answered it. After there. arriving in New France, Viol had relapsed back to Protestantism, a crime which was punishable by death. Then there was an issue of... 
Wait, 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 wait. I'm confused. Was all Protestantism a crime in New France at the time? And was that punishable by death? Was the fact that he had converted to Catholicism but reverted to Protestantism a sort of breaking of your vow? Was that the crime that was punishable by death? Alcohol. In New France, people were banned from providing liquor to the indigenous people of the area. This was a rule strictly enforced by the government. Turns out Buell was accused of selling liquor to the indigenous people in the area. Yeah, things weren't looking too good for him. Buell would be executed by being shot and killed in 1661 in Quebec City. The exact reason for his execution isn't known, and it is still a subject of debate amongst historians. He did face at least two charges that could have resulted in execution, and witchcraft wasn't one of them. Mm. So what happened to Halle? Well, her possession continued. In 1662, Catherine de Saint Augustine had her sewn into a bag, and this appeared to have worked. Helle recovered her health, and she would end up getting married and lived to the age of 52. There was another high-profile case involving witchcraft in 1682, this time in Montreal. A tavern keeper, Anne Lamarck, would be charged with adultery, promiscuity, running a brothel, and witchcraft. And the whole trial... And uh, there you have it. Um, gosh, so what a familiar story throughout the ages. You know, a woman who is running a brothel, charged with running a brothel. Um, you know, all these other charges that are viewed as sinful. Let's throw witchcraft in there, too. Of course, she must be a well, witch. It was a pretty sordid affair for 17th century. In fact, some of the testimony could be considered even sordid for today. Witnesses testified that she refused to take communion at Easter and had a spell book. She was also accused of using spells to bring the men of Montreal to her tavern where she would sleep with them. She was also accused of... <laughs> Again, so typical. So, so, so typical. No, because it couldn't be the men who just decided they wanted some and went to the tavern themselves. They must have been influenced by her. She must have put a witch... Which he spelled insulting on the parish priest, Father Etienne Guillaume, saying he wasn't worth to saying mass and that she had threatened to beat him like a dog. Now, insults towards the priest were actually kind of expected from the sounds of things. Reports are he was the type of priest who would rebuke parishioners from the pulpit. He was even called by an army officer who was in Montreal, Baron Louis Armand de La Hontan, a misanthropic bigot who found everything to be scandalous about mortal sin. The trial would stretch on for weeks. Almost 40 witnesses called to the stands. But in the end, the civil authority found her to be not guilty. Hmm. Turns out one of the key reasons for the lack of witchcraft trials in New France compared to places like New England was the fact that society was more secular. Historian Leslie Choquette wrote, quote, Neither the common folk nor the colony's leaders were particularly inclined to rigorous devotion. On the contrary, a measure of popular indifference was evident in prescribed behavior, or even outright anti-clericalism. And a modern mentality was often visible among the administrative elite. Unquote. I'm confused. And I think I'm relatively intelligent and uh, maybe I'm just jumping the gun by keep pausing this. He said before that the guy who had reverted to Protestantism, that was a crime punishable by death, that uh, he had to convert to Catholicism to even come to New France, that the, that the authorities were trying to keep Huguenots out. That doesn't sound like very secular uh, authority to me but yet now he's saying this, so I'm just confused about that. I'm trying to Simply reconcile put it, those two statements. The people of New France were more enlightened. There was another case that was heard in Montreal in the 1680s that had a similar outcome. Now, this one involved more of a blasphemy charge, which was closely associated with witchcraft in those days. And the case was against a Jean Boudour, a merchant in the community. He was charged after he had set up a servant who had passed out drunk during a dinner party in a manner similar to being crucified. 
And then the servant was awoken by Budor, who threw a bucket of cold water on him to make it seem like he was resurrecting him, just like Christ had arisen after his crucifixion. Now this upset many of the people, and they voiced their complaint to the judiciary, but like Lamarck, he was found not guilty. While the fear of witchcraft died in New England over the years, there were still a few more cases which popped up from time to time in New France. There was a case that happened in Bobassin, Acadie in 1684. In this one, the record shows that a man named Jean Campagnard was tried for witchcraft after the death of his employer. The death was caused after Campagnard had blown a powder into his boss's eyes. Now, I had actually stumbled across this tale while researching this week's episode and found it on a blog called Unwritten Histories. And this particular blog post, written by Stephanie Pettigrew, gave me the lead on a few of these tales. And I can't finish off this episode without giving a shout-out. Back to the story of Camp and Yard, there was a humorous exchange during the trial, which could only be quoted verbatim from Pettigrew's blog post. Quote, The witness states that he saw the accused spread mysterious seeds into a marsh while reciting an incantation, and the next fall, he had a terrible crop. And Campagnard replied, doesn't need magic to be a terrible farmer, unquote. Now, <laughs> perhaps the most famous case of a witch in New France or Quebec was the story of Marie-Joseph de Carriveau. Her story has become a legend in Quebec. However, she was never accused during her lifetime, really, of being a witch. Her whole story is a tragic one, as is the legend that developed in the years following. Marie Josephte was born in 1733 in Saint Villiers, New France, a community that is just upstream from Quebec City along the St. Lawrence River. Of the 11 children that her parents had, she was the only one to survive childhood. She would be married at the age of 16 to a 23 year old farmer named Charles Bouchard. They would have three children, two daughters, and a son before he passed away in 1760. She would remarry 15 months later to another farmer, Louis Etienne Daudier. In January of 1763, Daudier was found dead in the barn with multiple head wounds. Official cause of death was reported as kick to the head from a horse as the wounds were very similar to that. This didn't deter the community from gossiping though. After all, this was a woman who had two husbands die within a span of just a few years. The rumors would get to the British authorities who were occupying Quebec as part of the Seven Years' War, and they would take the matter up, starting an inquiry on March 29, 1763. Well, that, that is late for um, the witch, uh, witch scares and witch hunting. I don't think it was really going on very much in New England anymore by then. Um, Pretty sure not. Maybe tiny isolated incidences, but. Marie Josephte, no. along with her father, were charged with the murder of Dodier. Deciding their fate was a military tribunal of 12 English officers. A number of people in the community testified against the accused. And the case, which ended on April 9th, found the two guilty. Joseph Corvo was sentenced to death for the murder of Dodier, while Marie Josephte was convicted of being an accomplice to the murder was to be lashed 60 times and branded with the letter M on her hand. After he was condemned, her father changed his story and stated he was just the accomplice after the fact and that his daughter was the one who had killed Dodier. A second trial was held and at this second trial, Marie Josephte confessed to murdering her husband while he slept with a hatchet, two blows to the head. She was sentenced to be hung with her body to be suspended in a gibbet afterwards. She was executed just three days later, and then her body was placed into the gibbet, which hung at the crossroads of Lausanne and Bienville, which is today the intersection of Saint-Joseph Street and De Lenton Boulevard. The body remained suspended in the gibbet until May 25th, when the residents of the area asked that it be taken down. The gibbet was removed, and marie Josephte was buried in the iron cage of the gibbet, in the cemetery of Saint Joseph de la Pointe Levis. The gibbet would be dug up in 1851, and that is really when the legends began to grow about Corriveau. The gossip about her execution, how her first husband had died, and then how her second husband mm. had died shortly after, led to all sorts of legends. The story started with tales about how she was a witch, and then how her ghost still haunts that intersection. In fact, there are still tales that 
her ghost still haunts that intersection to this day, and how she poisoned her first husband. The number of husbands that she had grew as well, to as many as seven, all killed by Le Corriveau. The stories began to grow more and more with each author, playwright, and songwriter who touched the story. I feel like that's uh, something that happens often. You know, I don't know if people really believe it, but, uh, you know, we've got many incidences throughout history where something happens in real life and it just becomes this um, paranormal legend. You know, we've got here near where I live, the Amityville Horror House, actually very, very close to there. Um, you know, it was murders that took place, but in some sense, we kind of find these things fun. Um, which is weird when you really come to think of it because real people did lose their lives over it, but, you know, that's just human nature to create legend out of Adding more stories. and more until it became near impossible to separate the truth from the legend of Corrivo. To this legend. date, La Corrivo brings up images of a witch or even a supernatural being who to this day haunts the area in which she died. Her tale is one of sorrow and heartbreak, and must, one must wonder yeah. how true her confession was, or if she was simply confessing so that her father wouldn't have to be the one executed for the death of her husband, given that the record had already shown his death wasn't necessarily by human hand. The death of Corivo gave rise to a legend in the years that followed, but it wasn't the end of stories of witches and witchcraft trials in Canada. In fact, the last charges surrounding witchcraft in Canada are actually from this century. Seriously. In 2018, Dory Medina Stevenson of Milton, Ontario, was arrested under a little-known part of the Criminal Code of Canada. A week later, another woman claiming to be a psychic in Toronto, Samantha Stevenson, was arrested in a similar investigation. No word as to whether or not these two women were related, though. This section of the Criminal Code, which has since been repealed, was that they were charged with Section 365, and that made it illegal in Canada to fraudulently pretend to exercise or to use any kind of witchcraft, sorcery, enchantment, or conjuration. In fact, there were five people charged under Section 365 since the turn of the century before it was repealed. Uh, I know that history tends to look at things that happened more than 20 years ago, and technically these would count as current events in the academic approach to history, but it is pretty relevant to the episode, so that's why I figured I would bring it up. The section was repealed in 2018, just weeks after the charges were laid against the two Stevensons. So there we have it. A quick... Yeah, so that's interesting because uh, well, there are a lot of old laws on the books here that, you know, are not enforced. Um, if they are, then sometimes comes to fruition that uh, it needs to be changed. But I suppose what they were doing there were going after some unscrupulous people who take money from others you know there's a whole lot of debate about you know these uh, psychics and whatnot but look at which anyway i know there's much more to this topic and perhaps we will pay a visit to it again in the coming months maybe in october coming up on sunday we will be continuing our look at the war of 1612 and talking about three events that all happened in a span of six weeks all right, so that was over. Um, that was fun. Was that something that any of you knew about? It sounds like the legend of Coribo was uh, maybe something that continues to this day, and maybe that's uh, specific to Quebec. I don't know. I would love to know. Um, yeah, you know, my overall impression is the biggest difference between New France and New England was that New France was uh, more willing to not allow religious fervor to get in to their legal processes and that, you know, rules of evidence are more like modern rules of evidence and you wouldn't admit some inherently ridiculous and unprovable thing like spectral evidence. And so that resulted in less convictions. It also seemed like there was some financial motivation because the appeals were expensive and either the public purse or the magistrate themselves had to foot the bill. But either way, um, they're probably responsible for, you know, maintaining a certain budget 
um, and so it just wasn't worth doing. It also seemed like a lot of these cases were brought to uh, trial um, really on other grounds. Instead of using witchcraft as the manner in which to get somebody where the underlying dispute was something different, they were charged with the uh, underlying dispute, and witchcraft was just sort of thrown in there as an aside, and it wasn't the main focus. So, very interesting. It's not surprising. It would have been surprising to me if there wasn't any, you know, incidences of witch hunting, witch scares, and witchcraft in New France. Um, but it is very interesting to see the differences in which, in the ways in which it was dealt with in a much fairer way. I am still confused about what he said about uh, they're having more modern secular, secular attitude in the authorities when he also mentioned that, um, you know, Catholicism seemed to have been the ruler of the day and Protestantism was either illegal or certain aspects of it where he wasn't clear on that. And that is something I'm definitely going to look into, but I wouldn't mind if anybody would love to comment on that to have a conversation about it. That's what I love about this. All right, my friends, I shall see you very soon. Peace.